Change off of the three. There's the hit ahead, but it's deflected. J.R. Smith keeps it for the Cavs. Blake Griffin was supposed to be there under the basket for the Clips, but he's off jungling in the third row. This is... this is a weird sport. <laughs> Hello Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where we may or may not have had to Google the sports-related terminology used in our opening. But it was necessary because today we're talking about sports. No, no! No, wait, don't click off, come back. Seriously, there are video games here too, I swear. In fact, with this episode and a little bit of your tweeting power, it's my hope that we're gonna get gaming the respect that it deserves. You with me? Here's the situation. I'm sure all of us gamers by now are familiar with eSports, yes? Competitive video gaming with tens of millions of fans and dollars in prize money up for grabs? No big news there, right? Well, last July, ESPN2... Ooh. Puberty. Well, last July, ESPN2 ran a half-hour preview for the Dota 2 International Tournament and then aired the full event on ESPN3. And boy, howdy, Twitter lit up with a violent backlash against the appearance of esports on ESPN. Belittling comments like, Why are these kids playing video games on ESPN2? appeared along with criticism for the network, like, ESPN2 is seriously airing an online gaming competition? WTF, man. This is our society now. That is is not a sport. Come on, son! Uh, okay, not a super surprising response, but good on ESPN to take the first steps in recognizing the legitimacy of gaming as a sport, right? Well, maybe. A piece in The New Yorker from later that year inflamed the situation when John Skipper, president of ESPN, went on record to say that he still doesn't believe gaming is a sport, citing his preference for focusing on quote-unquote real sports. The article was picked up all over traditional and online news media outlets from USA Today to IGN. There's certainly been plenty of debate about it, but there hasn't been any media outlet or personality who's come back with a cogent argument for why John Skipper's way of thinking is, to put it like Completely vastly outdated. This is where you guys come in. Tweet this video at both ESPN and John Skipper. Oh, wait, he doesn't have a Twitter. Like I said, a little behind the times. Anyway, John Skipper and ESPN viewing audience, if you ever foray into the deep reaches of the internet far enough to make it to the YouTubes, it's more than just a wasteland of cat videos. This episode is dedicated to you. But loyal theorists and regular gamers, you should probably stick around too. I think some of this stuff is really gonna start to surprise you. First, let's get real here and look at the programming ESPN also regularly televises. The World Series of Poker, for instance, is aired on ESPN every year, but has almost no hallmarks of traditional sports. Team-based competition? Nope. Precision? Not in the traditional sense. Athletes in peak physical form? <laughs> okay. Yeah, alright, don't make me laugh. Sorry, Fossil Man. El Matador and Jesus. Really? Jesus? And people think gamers go by strange nicknames. Also in ESPN's programming lineup are shows about championship cup stacking along with spelling bees and scrabble competitions. And believe me, while well, I've been known to watch some expert cup stacking in my day, shout out to Rachel Nidro, what what? If you're looking for more of the S in ESPN, you'd be much closer to the mark by looking at this year's Dota 2 World Championship. Even if you don't know anything about video games, just consider it from a numbers perspective. Perspective. In 2013, Game 7 of the NBA Finals between the Heat and the Spurs was broadcast on ABC, a completely public broadcast TV network that I could stumble upon after my rerun of CSI, and drew 26.3 million viewers. That same year, the World Final of League of Legends was streamed on Twitch, a comparatively inaccessible online streaming site that you have to know about in order to navigate to. In the game's third year of competitive existence, it was able to draw a viewer count of 32 million, almost 20% more than the American Broadcasting Company. Still, you'd be right if you said that just because it's competitive entertainment that doesn't make it a sport. And that's where the rest of the episode comes in. If you're already a gamer, you probably already know that the biggest kid on the block when it comes to esports is the fast-paced player versus player combat of the MOBA, or the multiplayer online battle arena for you Espen fans who may be watching. MOBAs come in a lot of flavors, but the top contenders
contenders are League of Legends, Smite, and your various Dotas. These games have almost single-handedly defined the modern esports industry and have taken the image of hardcore gamers out of the basement and into sold-out arenas around the world. The economy, personality, and image of the MOBA is evolving and fast. And it's not just becoming the biggest thing in esports, but the biggest thing in sports sports. The esports phenomenon potentiated by the MOBA is invading the mega industry of traditional sports in a big way that will forever change the face of video games. But how? If you're a mid-twenties geezer like I am, you know that MOBAs have their roots in player-made custom game maps that have evolved and been made official over the years. The map size, layout of the battle arena, and player rules have all been refined to create the most balanced and unimpeded gameplay possible. Even the psychological effects of color have been accounted for in some of these games. In much the same way, parameters of modern sports have been established and are evolved over time, like the size of a baseball glove, which wasn't defined until 1973, or the size of the strike zone, which continues to change despite the fact that baseball is a 150-year-old game. The communities for MOBAs are mind-bogglingly large, with millions logging in to build their skills as individuals, as teams of friends, or as serious competitive players. The barrier to entry is relatively low, with a computer and an internet connection being pretty much all you need to get started as a casual player. Though they may seem like they're on opposite ends of the universe, millions of people are picking up the MOBA hobby just like millions started playing games of pickup basketball or tossing the football around in the backyard. But these are a lot of the superficial similarities. It goes a whole lot deeper than that. Take a look at the leagues themselves. For traditional sports, we'll use the NBA as the example. And for eSports, we'll look at the LCS, or League of Legends Championship Series. The league that represents the highest level of League of Legends competitions in the US and Europe. The NBA has 30 teams across the US and Canada that are split into two conferences who play against each other during a season which happens from October to April. The whole season culminates in a playoff tournament that decides the champion of each conference as well as the overall league champion. LCS, on the other hand, has 20 teams across the US and Europe which are split into two divisions based on continent. League play occurs on a set schedule of about four to five months out of the year, culminating in a playoff series that determines both European and North American League champions, as well as a separate tournament which decides the world champion. So the leagues and seasons look kind of similar, but so what? What about the teams themselves? Using our NBA example again, each team has to be a recognized member of the larger National Basketball Association, like an approved group who's officially recognized as a real deal NBA team. MOBA teams don't really work like that they work better. MOBA teams are currently admitted to major championship events after winning their way through a qualifying challenger series, basically playing their way up the ranks every year to become a recognized group within their game. In this way, the MOBA system actually recognizes the best players democratically rather than forcing players into a specifically recognized team before they're allowed to play. It's a meritocracy. The best players get recognized. Despite this difference though, there are also quite a few key similarities. In both cases, the teams are privately owned organizations or groups of people who are supported through merchandising and sponsorships. For example, here in LA, the Los Angeles Lakers are officially sponsored by big athletic brands like Adidas, Big Five, and Budweiser. The MOBA team, Cloud9, has sponsorships from similarly popular brands for gamers like Logitech, Alienware, and NVIDIA. NVIDIA? NVIDIA. In fact, in the last year, Fortune Magazine has run two separate pieces on traditional companies moving their sponsorships away from traditional sports avenues and towards eSports, citing the fact that sponsoring these teams is easy and effective. Companies like Red Bull, Coke, and Nissan are launching their eSports-specific social media campaigns, digital videos, and athlete support to make sure their teams and players have top-of-the-line equipment and arrive in style at national and international companies. Competitions. Just like in real sports, only the best of the best receive these big sponsorship deals, but the players with the dedication to make it to the top are rewarded quite well. While compared to most major athletes, the salaries of esports players are still relatively low, the last year has seen several of the top esports players break the seven figure mark, earning $1 million and up in sponsorships and in tournament play. And all you traditional sports fans, tell me if any of these roles sound familiar. Managers, coaches, 
starters, reserve players, referees? No, that's not a pro basketball team. These are some of the whole slew of roster requirements for esports tournament play. And, similar to traditional sports, there are strict rules about everything from how many players must attend tournament events to how many players you can dress to act as reserves if something happens to your A team. For this, we'll look at the NFL, where 46 players are allowed to dress for every game. With 11 offensive players and 11 defensive players, every position still has a backup and a few extra. Now look at most MOBA tournaments. Each team has a maximum of 10 players, with 5 players in the arena at all times and one backup for every player on the bench. And these players aren't just the guys you met in some chat room last week. <laughs> chat rooms, remember those? What a weird, weird place the internet once was. Anyway, these players aren't loners sitting in front of their computers. They're highly integrated teams who live together, eat together, train together. During play, they're connected and communicating constantly through in-game tactical signals and team speak instructions from the team captain and their coach. Sound familiar? It should. And while traditional football players, or American football players, are spending upwards of five to seven hours a day practicing and reviewing gameplay, tapes, MOBA players are training up to 12 hours a day in some countries, either practicing with the team, training on various new characters, or reviewing competitor matches. When they show up to competitions, they come prepared to win, and also to play by the rules, like all other professional athletes. The list of gameplay rules for MOBA tournaments are intense. Just like rules in the MLB stating that players can't have pictures of baseballs on their uniforms, MOBA players are banned from using special game skins that may distract or mislead the opposing team. Key binding and mods are heavily controlled in MOBAs, in much the same way that baseball players can't modify their gloves, helmets, or bats to give them a special advantage during competition. And remember that joke I made earlier about peak physical condition? MOBA players are in peak physical form, with heightened reflexes and clicking and typing speeds. Players are optimized machines for their matches, even going so far as to risk severe injuries for their sport from the millions of rapid twitch clicks they're making from years of training. And I I know you're probably laughing now about esports related injuries, but ask yourself this. Is it any more silly sounding than breaking a leg trying to catch a ball to score some imaginary points? Ask yourself that question honestly and objectively. It is not. So what's that leave? What haven't we covered here? What other boundaries need to be broken for MOBAs to be mentioned in the same breath as the NFL? The answer to that question actually has to do with two things. How MOBA sports are treated by public authorities, and how they're treated by us the fans. Let's start with the first one. Less than a decade ago, it was almost impossible for the US to host an international esports competition. Foreign competitors had the practically impossible task of obtaining visas to compete on US soil. And let's face it, it's not all that surprising when you consider the fact that esports aren't a familiar medium to most people over 35. Isn't that right, John Skipper? The bureaucracies in many countries, including the US, spent a lot of time envisioning esports as some kind of overinflated round of pong. But in 2013, the United States made a seminal move to recognize esports players as professional athletes, providing an official avenue for them to be issued athlete visas, the type reserved for the highest caliber of international players and Olympians. Now, everyone in the global esports community could compete in the same arena while being recognized by one of the world's most influential governments as international athletes. But it looks like ESPN needs something beyond just international governing body approval. They need something else, and that something else is us, the fans, public opinion, and this is where our article from the beginning of the episode comes in again. Well, there's certainly a subset of the gaming community who doesn't want to see MOBAs join the mainstream, who don't want gaming to become casual, popular, who want it to remain their own private, closed-off little community. Others who love gaming and want to share it, know that wider player pools make for better competition, and understand that with more respect for our favorite pastime comes more success and opportunity for all gamers in the world beyond our living room. So, Oh, what can we as the gaming community do to change minds? Well, MOBAs are already free to play and the rules are relatively simple, so what's missing from the picture? Well, one issue that's been cited with the MOBA community in general is the accessibility of the games for casual players. I know I said before that all you need is a PC and an internet connection, but really that means you still need a PC and an internet connection. Whether they're easy to come by or not, PC gaming has always had a perception of being somewhat niche relative to the broad 
broader console gaming population. Whereas you see frat guys cotting out on Xbox and grandmas dancing all over the Wii, PCs just don't have that inclusive family-friendly vibe. You can never share a PC with a friend to play at the same time without some level of technical knowledge, but you can always easily plug in another controller into your Xbox One. The games that have become household names are all super accessible, easy to play titles that look exciting, but not intimidating. If you think about it, it's the same way with sports too. Almost anyone, no matter how young or old they are, can toss a ball, understand the goals of winning a race, or just scoring a basket. So, how do we get MOBAs to feel like that? How do we equate taking down a tower to making a triple play, or defeating an enemy hero to making a three-pointer? What is the key to make the MOBA accessible enough that they become the game that everyone can play? Well, it turns out that one of the MOBA heavyweights might be getting wise. No, it's not the originator or the ultra hardcore, it's Smite. The MOBA that's been working on the accessibility angle for years without any of us gamers realizing it. Look at the way the game's designed. Smite's characters are designed to be more recognizable than other MOBAs. They're based off of gods from popular mythology rather than an internal lore or other games in a franchise. And look at its visual style. Smite is the MOBA to move away from the genre's real-time strategy roots, abandoning the top-down perspective to instead embrace a low-to-the-ground, high-action feel with an over-the- the shoulder view that would be more comfortable for players who are already familiar with the PvP aspects of Halo, Madden, and other Xbox or Xbox One Mega franchises. And speaking of those consoles, Smite's biggest move is becoming a more accessible game by being the first MOBA to have a console release. In fact, this just happened earlier this month. The hope is that this ultra-accessible version of the MOBA will take the first step to push the genre as a whole across the console PC gap. Hi-Rez, the makers of Smite, have already suggested that it's looking to take the new version of the game into a whole new esports tournament to create a league for PC players and a related league for console players. This way, when casual gamers or regular audience members watch a tournament, they see the same equipment they have in their own living room, not some huge, hulking, super-powered desktop, because, I mean, outside of the hardest of hardcore gamers, are people really buying those giant desktops anymore? It's as relatable as seeing the same tennis ball you toss to your dog being used in the US Open, or buying the same Nike shoes that your favorite pro basketball player is using. If those players can use their Xbox to win this awesome game, why can't you do exactly the same thing? At the end of the day, it's about making a connection with your audience and introducing them to the incredible skill it takes to pull off a winning streak strategy, whether it's on the football field or in a 5v5 digital arena. Will Smite's leap to console be the final springboard that esports needs to gain traditional sports recognition? I mean, outside of this episode, which has clearly started to bridge the gap and heal those wounds. Honestly, I don't know, but it seems to have a pretty good shot at doing it. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Or for a sign off you ESPN viewers might recognize, banana, banana. That's right, I watch part of the interruption too. I have diverse tastes. Welcome back to the Super, Super Amazing, Amazing End Card Tournament. Tournament. Where last time, for our episode looking at the possibility of hybrid dinos in honor of LEGO Jurassic World, I asked who you thought would win in a fight. Raptors with Stegosaurus tails or a T-Rex with Triceratops horns. It was a close match, but with 55% of the vote, the hybrid raptors took the day. I don't know though, with the big heavy Stego tails, I think the deadly mobility that raptors usually come come with might be harmed, hurting their overall performance in this match, but who am I to judge? The only big losers in that situation would clearly be mankind. Which brings us to today. I just want to know the answer to a simple question. Do you watch or even care about sports? Yes or no? Easy as that. Doesn't matter what, it could be baseball or basketball, either version of football, or even pro wrestling for that matter. Oh, heck. Throw in poker and cup stacking too. Basically anything you would see in ESPN's normal and approved programming lineup. Video game tournaments accepted. Come on, son! Click on one to choose and then check out the channel page where you'll see all the theories that I've been making that apparently haven't been making it into your sub boxes based on the people who still say I'm not doing theories often enough. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a need for some post-apocalyptic speed. 